My name is Colin Hammond, and I will be your host today. Next slide, please. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CSIA, we are a global nonprofit professional association with over 500 member companies in 35 countries. Next slide, please. To highlight just a few of, uh, of CSIA's many member benefits, the CSIA Best Practice Manual guides control system integration companies in the setup and running of a solid company. These best practices reflect the knowledge gained by SIs oh, over Georgia. the years and shared freely. Any SI company will benefit from deploying the best practices, but gaining the CSIA certification is a confirmation by a third party that you have deployed them correctly. Maintaining a valid certification ensures that your company stays on a path of continuous improvement. For, partners, CS, or for partner members, CSIA offers an ecosystem to grow their SI programs. Understand their customers' pain points, monitor industry trends, and share their thought leadership. Next slide, please. A trusted source of qualified integrators and suppliers, the CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange helps SIs, industry suppliers, manufacturers, and process companies connect and do business. That makes Exchange a first-stop shop where end users can compare integrators, determine which products to use, and have questions answered by specialists in the field. For SIs and partners, it provides a platform to increase your digital presence, support your content and SEO marketing efforts, position your company and C-suite as thought leaders, showcase your expertise, and nurture prospects by providing a trusted credible source for information about your company and its products. Next slide, please. Finally, a reminder that in 2021, you will have increased access to knowledge sharing, community building, and networking throughout the year when you join or renew your CSIA membership. CSIA is committed to delivering extremely relevant content to system integrators while providing partner members access to a highly engaged audience. To that end, CSIA will deliver weekly virtual events on a broad range of topics and experiences, all of which are open to sponsorships. For more information about CSIA membership, virtual events, sponsorships, and advertising opportunities, contact us at info at staff.controlsys.org or 847-686-2245. And at this time, I would like to introduce today's moderator, Lisa Richter. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, guys. Good morning. Before we get started, I have a couple pro tips for the platform here to help you have the best experience this morning. My first tip is to go ahead in that right up-hand corner. There will be an option either for gallery view or speaker view. I recommend speaker view. And then also there's a view options um, in the top nav, there's a little carrot that is a drop down menu that will allow you to select side by side, which is another way I think you can optimize the way you're viewing this morning if you have that option. And then also don't forget that there is a slider bar that goes down the middle of, or maybe it's two thirds of the way of your screen there. And you can move that slider bar to increase or decrease the view of the speaker or the slide deck. We also super encourage you to be engaged in the content here by putting your comments in the chat button and the chat feature. In fact, I would love it if you right now just popped on there and let us know where you're dialing in from. And I don't mean your bathroom, <laughs> but where you are in the country or the world. It was just, it's really fun for us to see um, everybody coming together around the United States or the world. Last time we did one of these, we even had somebody from Thailand. So super interesting. Um, and then if you want to submit a question, please do so using the Q&A feature. Having these content streams separate just helps us get a, keep a, stay a little organized, right? Um, so now I'm going to move on to introducing the panelists. And I want to do something a little different today. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in their real job, but also what they might be in a parallel universe. So I will start. I'm Lisa Richter, I'm CSIA's industry director, and in a parallel universe, I would probably be a librarian. Karen, what about you? 
Hi, thank you. I'm Karen Griffin. I'm the Vice President of Controls and Automation at Hargrove. In a parallel universe, I'm going to be a travel blogger. Nice. Steve? Maybe you're on mute, Steve. <laughs> you go. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're at. Um, I'm Steve Malisco. I'm, I'm co-founder and, and CEO of Malisco Engineering. I'm also on the CSIA Board of Directors uh, this year. And in a parallel universe, you know, I love to ski, snow ski, and, uh, you know, I, I like a simple life. So I've always wanted to be uh, just a lift operator, you know, a lifty. You know, I want to be that person that stands there at the chair and just tells people, come on up to the line, wait for the chair, have a good day. And that's the sum total of my responsibilities. <laughs> Sounds pretty simple, but also it's in a beautiful part of the mountains. I love it. Georgia, what about you? Oh, I'm Georgia Whalen, owner of Rivergate Marketing. In a parallel universe, I would love to own a horse ranch out in Montana or up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Jeff? Hi, my name is Jeff Winter. I am Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives with Grand Tech Systems Integration. And in a parallel universe, I would love to be one of the jokers on the true TV show, Impractical Jokers. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. That was super fun. Um, for the attendees, if you want to put something about what you would be in a parallel universe, feel free to share that in the chat feature. Let's see what kind of weird occupations you all are going to come up with. Um, so to get to the content now, before we start on the how, I thought we would take a minute to kind of provide some context and talk a little bit about why we're having this, this discussion today. And I'm going to turn that over to Steve to do that. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, let's, let's put it this way. The reason why, you know, why does it matter is, you know, um, as I was uh, as, as I was growing and helping develop uh, Melisco Engineering over the last 26 years, um, you know, people told me, uh, you know, I got to get out and talk to more people. Uh, but they also said, hey, you know what? No one ever did business with someone they'd never met. You know, they said, so you got to get out there and talk to people. And, you know, as we as system integrators, um, you know, if we're going to grow uh, and, and survive and thrive our business, you know, what do we have to do? We have to go out and make that first impression. You know, we got to go out and continue to seek new clients. We've got to, you know, we possibly have to seek alliances with OEM, suppliers, distributors, reps, you know, and then, and then a lot of places, uh, people change. And so we're always constantly having to meet those new decision makers, influencers, gatekeepers. We, we, you know, we used to have to get to know those people on a personal basis. So, that, you know, the old traditional way was we arrange a face-to-face -face meeting. We get people from their company to meet people from our company. We, uh, you know, we usually have some kind of a, uh, a PowerPoint or, or preparation, and we uh, sit down and go through it. You know, but the key there was that it was in-person interaction, okay? And that's the way it used to be. But then earlier this year, next slide, boom, what happened? We got hit with COVID-19, and then all of a sudden made a major paradigm shift in everything. Uh, next slide. It, it affected our personal lives. It affected our professional lives. Um, but nonetheless, we still have those needs as integrators. Uh, if we're going to survive and grow our business, you know, despite the significant in interruption in the physical human contact, we still need to seek new customers. We still need to seek those alliances. We still need to get to know those new decision makers and influencers. But now the rules of engagement have changed. Social distancing is required. You know, group in-person meetings almost entirely eliminated. For the most part, companies are enforcing travel bans on all personnel. And then uh, for the most part, uh, companies are also insisting that we all work from home uh, and that's being mandated. So at this point, though, we got to come up with a new school of, meth of method of continuing to make that first impression. So that's why we're here today. So, Lisa, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Steve. OK, let's get started with the how. Karen, uh, why don't you start us off, please? Thank you, Lisa. So to start with the how, let's talk about the agenda. And it's not unlike face-to-face -face presentations, but it's still important to have a clear agenda. And this best practice helps ensure you're on point with your message and that it lines up with the expectations of your audience. When working in a virtual environment, you need to keep the audience engaged. If you're covering a topic they are not interested in, odds are they're gonna flip over to something else. You wanna keep people engaged? You need to speak to the points that they are interested in hearing about. 
So agendas are gonna help keep you, your meeting on track. If everyone has good alignment on the discussion points that are upcoming, it will help avoid unnecessary tangents where questions may lead you to bounce around on topics and never really get a chance to drive your message home. If there's a burning question and your audience knows there's already an agenda item that may answer that question, people will likely hold those questions and see if they're addressed or they'll bring them up at a discussion point where it's less likely to disrupt your flow. You know, agendas also help frame up how much time you have to discuss each topic you intend to cover. Now, remember, in a virtual environment, you will not have the opportunity to roll from presentation to lunch or dinner. So you have to be efficient with your time. You have to be realistic about how much time introductions take. And you're also going to need to leave time for questions and discussions that lead to the next steps. Once you take those activities into account, you're going to have a better assessment of just how much content you can cover. So next slide, please. Preparation. So that last point is actually a very good segue into this topic, uh, preparation. So practice the timing of your introductions, your content that you intend to cover. Know that you have the time to focus on what really matters. Your goal is to create enough interest that you can have meaningful open discussion that leads to the next step. So make sure that you have a presentation of some nature. It keeps your audience grounded on the current topic. In a virtual environment, people are tempted by distractions such as emails, IMs, and anything else at their fingertips. You might be looking at the election results right now, but even with the most dynamic speakers. So having a presentation that reminds the audience of the current discussion topic helps them flip back quickly, and it's gonna keep people better engaged. Know the environment you're working in. Actually practice a dry run in that environment. Your systems integrators make the first impression, know the software and be comfortable with it. Know what tools you're gonna to be needed to carry your message. How many of you have been in a meeting where somebody shared a video, but no sound came through? Simply practicing sharing the video with one of your teammates in a virtual environment that you plan to use would have brought this challenge to life. A quick Google search will then guide you on how to include system audio when sharing your video and avoid having a highlight of your presentation fall flat. Do you need to use a whiteboard? There's virtual whiteboards that'll allow you to bring this element in. If you plan to use it, practice it. Practice what you plan to demonstrate. Do you wanna go old school? You can actually set up a camera that focuses on a whiteboard. It doesn't have to be one right behind you. You can have that camera set up to angle properly and show the, the detail that's needed for that whiteboard. You can have that camera dialed into the meeting, but whatever route you take, figure out what tools you need and know how to use them. Next slide, please. So let's talk about backup plans. Make multiple backup plans. A, B, C, D, however many you need. And, and sure, things happen and people are gonna understand that certain things, they can't be avoided. But think about the impression that you have, that you're going to make if, if something potentially disruptive does happen, but you are able to demonstrate that you already prepared for that in, in the event that it, that it comes to fruition and you have a plan to address it. The message that you deliver in that instance can't be carried in words. So, with all this practice and, and the thought that you put into your next opportunity for a virtual meeting, what can go wrong? Peter's law tells us if anything can go wrong, fix it. Okay, so there's another little phrase about Murphy's law in there, but, but fix it. You know, internet connectivity can be an issue. Have a hotspot charged, ready to take over. Failover routers could be something that you need to consider if that's a frequent occurrence where you are. Power outages can occur. If this is a critical meeting, make sure you've got everything charged. You need to be able to ride through power outages and internet connectivity issues. And having that already set up, again, something you cannot deliver in words, knowing your clients will get a sense that you are preparing for, for the not normal and you really already had a plan to address it. So another example, something happens where somebody on your team is no longer available to deliver a message that you intended them to cover have somebody else prepped and ready to go. When you're doing face-to-face -face meetings, you oftentimes have a drive to a client site somewhere that you can brief that teammate and get them spooled up and ready to present. In the virtual environment, this can literally happen within minutes of starting your meeting. And of course, your client will understand extenuating circumstances in the event the unexpected arises. 
but think of the depth in your team you're able to demonstrate when your plan B, so to speak, is so well prepared. You can prepare your team, have your timing down and ensure any technology you plan to use works flawlessly, but you cannot control the audience you are presenting to. If there are technical challenges or they simply cannot be available for the entire time allotted or some other reason, be ready to pivot. Be ready to adjust your timing on agenda topics so you can focus on what is most important. Having that plan already developed will help you deliver your message concisely, ensuring that you get your key points across and that you leave time for meaningful open discussions that lead to the next steps. So as you think through contingency plans, don't forget the most important step, test the backup plan. You cannot rely on a backup unless you have prepared to execute it at a moment's notice. So that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Karen. Georgia, over to you. What are some other tips? All right. So the icebreaker. Um, I, I feel like I'm showing, and this is a technical difficulty. Lisa, is that happening? Yes. Uh this is Colin. I'm trying to get it over to you, Georgia, and it is not spotlighting you. Um, I can't see your screen. All right, we'll just go forward with the audio. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and deliver with the audio, Georgia. Okay. All right, well, this is an example of, uh, <laughs> of crashing and burning. So anyway, with the icebreaker, first of all, you wanna smile. Uh, it can't be understated what a smile can do to just open up and, and have a presence about you and smiles are contagious. So if you're smiling, they're gonna smile. Georgia, you're back up and running. Just wanted to let you know you were good to go. Can you hear me? Yep, and we can see you too, so it's working well. Okay, I feel like I'm echoing, but it might be on my end. Okay, so far as the introductions, you definitely wanna give everyone a an opportunity to introduce themselves. It's gonna give um, early engagement from their end to get them fully engaged in the mood in the meeting. And then you're gonna to wanna to scan the news. Um, if you're in Boston like we are and you have someone that you're meeting with that's across the country in Nebraska, if there's been a hailstorm or a tornado, you know, it's good for you to know that when you're joining the meeting and you can ask them about it. it shows you care about what's going on in their area. Um, so far as another way of finding common ground is to look at LinkedIn see how, or not only can you look at the personal profiles, but you can look at the company. You might find some common connections looking at the personal profiles. Well, when you're looking at the company, you can scroll down, look at their feed and see what's going on with their company. Are they, um, have they recently introduced a new product or did they recently, attend a virtual event. Um, so anyway, I, I think that my, I'm gonna have to bow out because I, I know that whatever is happening with my audio is is got to be annoying to people. <laughs> so yeah, um, I think we probably got at least I'm gonna give it back to you and go ahead on to Jeff because it's obviously not working. Yeah, I think it's because you've got two microphones on, but yeah, we will we will move on. But before we move on, I wanna do a quick poll. We're gonna have to um, zoom through some of these slides, Violetta, yep. So before we go on, I wanna do a quick poll. Maybe we're sick of polls right now because of what's going with, on with the election, but bear with me. This is a fairly easy one. 
Um, this poll is kind of to get your feedback on how you feel about virtual backgrounds. Are you, ugh, can we not? Are you, meh, they're okay in some instances. Or are you Teams Zoom backgrounds? Let us know what you think about them and these results. I know internally we've had this discussion ourselves, so it'd be interesting to see what people are feeling about it. Um, looks like it, it's, it, most people are kind of saying, meh, they're okay. And kind of evenly split on the yay and nay. So interesting to see that. Um, I will go ahead and share those results then. Um, awesome. All right, so I think we're um, speaking of Zoom backgrounds or virtual backgrounds. We're going to cover that topic in with our next speaker, which is Jeff. Jeff, you're up. Hello, everyone. Uh, Jeff Winter here, and I'll be talking about the next uh, four best practices, first of which is using your camera. Now, this one may seem simple and fundamentally basic, yet it's still quite common to be having virtual meetings where people don't use their camera. A study of over 2,000 workers conducted by Harris Poll in June of this year, which is the peak of working from home during the COVID, found that roughly 60% of people are either always or sometimes likely to enable video during virtual meetings. That's not that high, especially knowing that nearly every computer has a camera and virtual meetings are currently our main option to communicate and connect with coworkers, peers, partners, and customers. What's even more fascinating is the number one reason was uncomfortability, which is interesting knowing that we feel comfortable being face-to-face. -face. But what we may not realize is how much this hurts our ability to make good and lasting impressions. Some of you may have heard of the 738-55 rule, which is a concept actually from the 70s concerning the communication of emotions, where 55% of our communication is done through our body a lot more than our voice and our spoken word. That is more than half of our communication just lost by simply not being seen while communicating. Now, anyone in sales knows the power of face-to-face -face communications as even Harvard Business Review shows it's 34 times more effective than email. 34 times is a lot. And in the world of coronavirus, face-to-face -face has become a rarity. So how do we make up for it? using our technology to bring us as close to true face-to-face -face as possible. And this boils down to one simple action, use your camera, always. Otherwise you're gonna be missing out on a majority of connections with other people that you're talking to. So now that we agreed on your need to use a camera, let's talk about using the right camera. Spend the hundred dollars and buy an HD camera, it's worth it. Let me show you a quick demonstration on the impact a standard built-in camera from my 2017 laptop has with a 2018 just run-of-the-mill external webcam. Violetta, stop sharing, please. How does this look versus, versus this? I'm going to do that one more time. How does this look versus this? So notice two things here, quality of image and position of the camera. Which one bodes better for my professionalism? Which one makes me feel more inviting and easier to talk to? And ultimately, which one makes a better first impression? Key takeaway, use your camera and get a decent one. Share the screen again and next slide. We'll share the presentation. All right, next one, be camera ready. So now this is an extension off of using your camera, just like everyone makes a concerted effort to look good in person, make a concerted effort to look good in front of a camera, especially knowing we're trying to make a good first impression. And this goes beyond just dressing professionally but also making sure that your space and your home looks good. So now regarding virtual backgrounds, I'm gonna take a different spin on these from the poll that just was conducted. That was more about how you feel about them. I wanna talk about them in relation to building connection for a better first impression. Regardless of whether you like them or not, either is the one using them or is the one seeing someone else use them, they put up a wall blocking an additional layer of personal connection with whomever you're talking to. 
a virtual background, it, it can be useful and it can be very useful, especially during like large, big presentations. But one-on-one -on -one or small intimate groups, it makes it harder to find ways to connect to someone, especially if you don't already know them. Now, almost everyone's working from home now, which means that you can see into other people's homes and they can see into yours. Let your camera be a way to lower your guard and let people into your home, virtually speaking, of course, and use it as a way to connect with the people that you talk to. Studies show that the more you lower your guard and become vulnerable with the people that you talk to, the more people trust you. And trust is a key component of making good first impression. The key takeaway here, have everything your camera sees look professional. Don't just dress up, but have a bad background. And be strategic with your choice of when to use virtual backgrounds. All right, next slide. Lighting. So lighting makes a big difference in professionalism also. Too much light washes you out and too little light or the light coming from the wrong direction makes you a shadow. Neither look good and neither make a good first impression. Let me show you a little demonstration of how this works. Violetta, uh, uh, please stop sharing again. Look at the impact opening my blinds has. Now, this is much nicer for me in here, in my home office, but it's worse for you. Now look at this. I'm gonna turn on my overhead lights. Look at the impact this has. Now it's too bright, it doesn't look as good either. So play around with the lighting and test what works best for you, but don't forget about it. If you have a hard time controlling your lighting or uh, moving your camera, you may want to invest in a light attachment. They're as cheap as $20 and they attach right to your monitor and they help even out the light just for video conferences. So it may be worth investing in that. All right, share the screen again and next slide. My last topic is screen sharing. Now, I'm not talking about the obvious cases where you're giving a presentation where showing your screen is the purpose of your meeting, but rather the cases where you're having more of a discussion or a meeting with one or just a few people. Where the, sim the simple recommendation here is to share your screen as much as possible. You have to remember that people can't see what you're doing, so it's easy to assume that you're distracted if you aren't looking directly at them. Even if your intentions are good, and let's say you have one monitor to set up the, the, to see the faces of the people you're talking to and another monitor to take your notes on, which is my real setup right now, no one knows that because you can't see my setup or what I'm doing, which means the people you're talking to don't know what you're doing and don't understand your setup. All they see is that you're not looking at them and looking at something else. So what do you think when you're having a conversation with someone virtually and you see them starting to look clearly in some other direction. How does this look right now for me? Do you feel I'm fully engaged and fully paying attention? However, what about if I show you what I'm doing? So, How does this come across? A little different if you can actually see what it is that I'm doing. Clearly, I'm just taking notes, but now you know that. Now, obviously my example here is fake, but make it real when you're talking to a customer. If you don't have anything to present, consider showing them your notes. Even if you aren't taking any notes, it shows the other person what you're doing with your computer, or more importantly, what you're not doing. Commenting on random people's political posts on Facebook. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Violetta, go ahead and share the screen again. The other option, if you don't feel comfortable with that, go the old fashioned route and use pen and paper. No one will question what you're doing if they see you look down and holding a pen. Even if we're in the middle of a conversation and I look down to write something down, it doesn't look nearly as distracting is if I look away and you can hear me typing and see the reflection of the light on my face. So the key takeaway, remember, people can't see what you're doing on your computer. Don't give them a reason to believe that you're not fully engaged. That's it for mine. Back to you, Lisa. Thanks, Jeff. And now we're gonna punt it back over to Steve. Steve, you're back on. 
Okay, th thank you. A um, couple of topics I want to talk about. Um, uh, one is flow. Okay, uh, you know, you got to keep the flow. Uh, you want to keep your meetings uh, and your messaging moving forward. You know, but that doesn't necessarily mean if you're the primary uh, presenter, you don't have to do all the talking, you know, involve others in the dialogue, you know, uh, and that's especially true if, let's say, for instance, uh, you have maybe two or three other people from your company that are involved in, in the presentation, get them involved, give them relevance as to why are they sitting there, uh, don't just put them in a position where they're introduced and they sit on the sidelines and then the audience may run the risk of sitting, sitting there thinking, well, what are these other guys uh, involved in this meeting for? Get them involved. Another consideration is ask the audience at various times, maybe open-ended questions, maybe solicit some feedback, get them to open up. But, but if you do and you hear crickets, I mean, don't, you know, don't get nervous, that'll happen. But, but most importantly though, stay on topic. You know, don't go drifting off uh, talking about ancillary things or, uh, you know, various items, make sure that you always stay on topic and, and keep the main reason for why you're having that meeting obvious to the audience. Uh, and, and as you uh, work through the flow, you know, don't talk too fast, don't talk too slow, just, just keep a, a, a steady cadence. Very importantly, though, always make sure that you pro progress to having an outcome for the meeting, you know, have a call to action, you know, identify who, who's doing what and when. So, you know, flow is very important. Um, also too, if we go to the next slide, bear in mind, and, and we, we briefly talked about this earlier, but uh, make sure you're muting. You know, in, in this particular case, you know, silence is golden. You know, you have to make sure that you plan ahead for, you know, any extraneous audio distractions, uh, you know, like pets, kids, road traffic, um, you know, make sure you're putting your cell phone on silence. Or if you're in your office, like I am today, putting your uh, office phone on do not disturb. So you don't all of a sudden get, um, you know, get, get phone calls, you know, find a quiet place, let other people know in your office or your home that, Hey, I'm, I'm part of a very, uh, uh, you know, important presentation here. Uh, and, and so I, I want I want the audience to focus on my messaging uh, so that I get a really good uh, first impression. So you mute, you know, when you when you're not speaking, uh, you know, when when others are speaking or the audience members are speaking, or basically when you have nothing to nothing to say or contribute. Mute is very, very important. So that's it. You know, those are the two uh, items, uh, follow-on items I wanted to add uh, to considerations uh, on this first impressions. Thanks, Steve. All right. So, Violetta, will you do me a big favor? And I'm sorry to do this for to you, but can you go back to Georgia's slides? That would be um, we got we got her back on, so we can hopefully get her content in here as well. Um, Georgia, welcome Perfect. back. <laughs> So I don't have an echo anymore, I hope. No, um, you sound good. Go yeah. for it. So, so that was slightly embarrassing, but, um, but hey, the show goes on, right? So anyway, for, for my next topic, besides icebreakers, which that was a tough one for me, um, use graphics. A picture, we've all, all heard, a picture is worth a thousand words. 65% of us are actually visual learners. And studies have shown that if you hear information, three days later, you will have retained 10% of that information. While if you hear that same information and it's coupled with a graphic, you will actually retain 65% of that information three days later. So that's pretty powerful. Next slide. And I just gave you that information in bullet points, but this is just a way of showing you if I had talked through that with this up, it would give you a, a better way of, of retaining that information, understanding that 10% of what you hear, you're going to retain. But if you have, if you add in the visual, you're going to remember 65%. Next slide is another example. So we wanted to um, give you 
some virtual event statistics uh, to, to show again how the graphics work. So I could give you this information in this format, which is all text, or next slide. I could give it to you in a bar graph. And here you see that out of 2,280 participants surveyed, this, uh, this, these are the results. So it jumps out at you right away that 798 found the biggest annoyance to be the bad connection. So that's the worst thing. <laughs> and I just experienced that. Um, 684, and I just experienced this, find the biggest annoyance, bad audio. Um, while the uh, bad camera comes in third and a messy background comes in fourth. So next slide. Some more virtual event statistics for you to again demonstrate this concept. So I could go through these stats as they are written out or next slide. I can give you a visual while I'm talking about. So in this um, particular stats, the, these stats represent 3,000 marketers and virtual event organizers that were surveyed. 49% of those surveyed said that audience engagement is a key to a, a successful event, while 81.8% said that they use polling, as we have, to keep the audience engaged. 71% say that a success factor that they rate themselves on are deals closed. Well, of course, we're all going for that deal closed. And 61% will use video to keep the engagement going. Next slide. So the unexpected. <laughs> you would think maybe I set myself up. Um, to show you the unexpected can happen. We're all working from home um, and it's, it's new to many of us. It's really not new to us. So I'm a little embarrassed that that happened. We've been doing this for 11 years at Rivergate Marketing, but other things have happened such as a delivery man arrives and my German shepherd goes off barking in the middle of the world's worst you know, time for that to happen. Right now he's on the deck. <laughs> so that he can't do that here. But um, whether you have kids in the background or a husband that suddenly comes in your office not realizing that you're in a meeting, it will happen and there is an upside to it. It does humanize you um, for people. You know, we're all in this pandemic together and you've got to be able to take those things when they happen in stride and not get too caught up on it. So with that said, Lisa, turning it back to you. Yep, thanks Georgia. Thanks for being such a good sport and just kind of winging it. I appreciate that. So now that we've gone through our official agenda here today, but I would like to open up the discussion to Q&A. So if you have any questions, please populate that little Q&A feature at the bottom and go ahead and put your questions in there. Or if you have other tips that you'd like to share with everybody, um, let us know what those are. Uh, but sort of kick things off, I'll start with a few questions that I've got um, I've got lined up for the panelists and they're sitting there get, getting ready to get pop quizzed. Um, so let's see how they do. Um, Steve, I have a question for you. If you want to take off your mute button there. Done. Done. Awesome. So for people who are of a certain age, shall we say, maybe non-digital natives, um, do you have any tips for them to help them feel more comfortable with the virtual environment and the you know, technology? She picks, you know, she picks on the old guy. <laughs> you know, that's okay. That, that's all right. That's all right. I, I, I know my place in the world. Uh, but no, it's a great question, uh, Lisa. And, uh, you know, um, for the, you know, for people uh, of my advancing years who may not be, who may not grew up with the technology, you know, my, my um, I guess my um, words of wisdom would be embrace the technology. 
you know, find someone, find someone in the younger generation who knows the technology, uh, use them as a mentor, ask a lot of questions, you know, don't be afraid to let them teach an old dog new tricks, you know, uh, because really all we're talking about here is, is learning a new way of doing what you have been doing for years, uh, you know, making that personal contact uh, you know, building that relationship. Uh, that's what that's what has made you guys over the years so successful. And I know some of you and, and you guys have done a great job of, of having great personalities, great ways of, of conveying the value you, you provide to uh, clients and all that. This is just another way of, of uh, extending that. And so I would say you uh, embrace it, use it, uh, find a mentor, and, and get comfortable with it because uh, th this is going to be the new normal. Absolutely. Now in the Q&A section, we've had somebody pipe up, which I shouldn't say somebody, it's my boss, Jose. He's saying that another great tip for presenting is to do it standing up. And because he feels like that really projects a lot more energy. Um, for some people that makes it a little bit more scary, but um, maybe give that a try. And then we have another question that says, are there certain things that you should put in your background, such as plants, pictures, books, et cetera, that would make your background more inviting? Um, Jeff, I'm gonna pick on you for this one. Sure, I, I think that that's a, a great, great question. Um, I, would, I would focus it around professionalism, making it look like you want it to look and how you would want uh, to see for the other person. But I'm going to flip it on the other side because you're looking at necessarily your background, which is half the equation of, of what you see. Like for mine, I have minimalistic on purpose. It's just my wall to make it simple. That's the, the choice I made. But if you see things in other people's backgrounds, it's the ability to use them, those things to humanize the situation, draw connections with those people, whether it's a picture, a map, uh, a book, a flower, or whatever it is in the background, to use that as an ability to connect with the person. So that's the other half of the equation I would have. Yeah, I would agree with that. There's also, if you really want to get super geeky about it, there's um, plenty of information online about how to have different dimensions in your, in your video presence. So you might have something close range, something medium range, and something long range. But I mean, now you're getting into director territory. It just depends on how geeked out you want to get about it. Um, so another question for you, Jeff, here is, you know, this idea that getting on camera is a good idea, but sometimes you can't get the other person to do that, right? They're too, a little too uncomfortable, or maybe they didn't wash their hair that day, or maybe they just, you know, are shy. Do you have any tips for getting the other people more comfortable getting on camera? Sure. Two things there. So there's, there's actually research that shows this for one-on-one -on -one. Uh, conversations that if you show if you share your camera, the other person is far more likely to share it without even ever asking for it. It doesn't work as much if there's 30 people on a call for one person to share the camera. So I always recommend you start by setting the example, share your camera. The other is just to actually make light of the situation that we're in for COVID right now and go, hey, I'd love to see you face to face, but I can't, you know, so we're in this situation, you know, at least share your camera so we can we can look like we're face to face. So even just asking that may be a good approach, but I always recommend start by sharing your camera. Camera, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, chances are they will too. I think too, maybe there's some people who feel like they don't look good on camera, so they don't wanna put the camera on because they are self-conscious about how they look. And I think your point about lighting is gonna help really help that too. Everybody looks good when they're well lit. I mean, that's why you have all the filters in the old Hollywood movies, right? And then also where the camera angle is, I think that helps, you know, we all take selfies like this, right? Why? Because we look thinner, because it elongates our neck. Whereas if the camera's down here, now you're seeing my double chins, you're seeing my nose hair. Um, so I think that also if people felt like they looked a little better on camera with, and by using those simple tips, they might be more willing to get that, turn that camera on, right? Um, okay, so who am I gonna pick on next? Let's see. Um, Georgia, how about you? I'll pick on you now. You mentioned the, how important the use of graphics is for your presentations, but there are probably people who don't have designers on staff or um, really don't have the resources to pay for a designer. Are there free uh, programs out there that people can use to create nice looking graphics? Yes, and that's a great question. Even at Rivergate Marketing, um, we just added Lauren, our great graphic designer, um, actually back at the beginning of the pandemic. So 
Um, prior to that, we actually use Canva, um, which is an online tool that is extremely user friendly, easy for somebody to use to make some graph uh, great graphics. There's paid versions, which we had uh, utilized and still utilize, but there's also free versions of that that you can use to create some simple graphics. You can also just use an Excel spreadsheet and put numbers in there and then turn it into um, a graph, right, in Excel um, or a bar chart. So there are solutions to be able to do it without, doesn't have to be fancy, but creating the graphic does help um, your audience retain information. Thanks, Georgia. So Jose is piping up again here in the Q&A box, offering more tips for um, getting on camera. He says, another recommendation, if you set yourself up with a camera on top of the monitor and have a place where you work regularly, all that just make it super easy to kind of sit down, turn it on and connect, um, to get things going like that. So my next question is gonna be for Karen. Um, I know we have done a couple practice runs and you've gotten on these calls one time when just after a hurricane <laughs> and you're just merrily going all along like nothing's happening. Um, so what are your tips? You know, how do you have yourself set up at home to ensure that you've got that redundancy and resilience for when anything can happen? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, just the backup plans and thinking through, you know, we're working at home, your internet might go out, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. I think the internet connectivity presented a challenge. Have hotspots ready, um, have them fully charged. Yes, we, you know, I had several meetings the, the day that a hurricane rolled through and one of them was with you all uh, in a practice run, but but some of those meetings that I, I really needed to be in and, and any client out there will understand that there's a hurricane rolling through your area and it's a perfectly acceptable reason to not plug in. But the, the damage was already done. The storm had already rolled through. You were at a safe point. You'd like to seize what's left of that day. It was definitely disrupted and, and you've got plenty of time to deal with the aftermath. You'd like to seize the things that you had planned for that day. So yes, there were there were multitude of things that were fully charged to enable that day to keep going because our power was out at midnight the night that the storm came through and it wasn't restored until later in that day. And, and for some of my teammates, it was multiple days, you know, 10 to 15 days before their power is restored. And, and we have generators in the area that we live in, and, and you can keep things charged in a way that keep you rolling through your day. But just assess where you are. A hurricane is not something that happens to us all of the time, but it is frequent enough that we do prepare for it. Our disaster uh, recovery plan and our business continuity plans all address these elements, and we carry that to how we are going to continue our business when we're not working from the office. But I do highly recommend that you just think through those common things that are likely to happen. Yeah, thanks, Karen. All right, looks like we've got all of our questions answered. Um, so we're going to wrap things up here. Violetta, if you want to put up that final, there you go, the resources slides. Nice job. So um, this is a link to a downloadable document that has some of the content we presented here today in a handy dandy checklist kind of form. Um, if you don't have, I, I will share these slides. Be, you could just send me an email and um, I will happy to send over these slides. Um, Violetta, you want to go to the next slide, please? Or you can contact any one of us on the panel if you want to have a side discussion or say hi or ask a question that you're too shy to ask today, feel free to um, contact them and, and ask them for their help. I appreciate that. So I'm going to wind this down here and I'm going to kick it over to my colleague, Colin, to take it on home. Bye, guys. Thank you, guys. And on behalf of CSIA, I would like to thank the panelists for this informative discussion. I'd also like to thank all those attendings. We hope you found this virtual event informational. We'd also like to remind you that a recording will be available for viewing within 30 days of this event. Please visit the CSIA website to view this recording or a past webinar you may have missed. Finally, be sure to bookmark the CSIA events calendar so you don't miss any upcoming events. And that concludes our program for today. Once again, thank you for joining us and have a good day, everybody.